Okay, thank you for, um, for organizing this and for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I find the topic quite fascinating. It's not a topic that I have occasion to think about very often. And uh, um, uh, I'm going to say some things. I guess I should give a little bit of a trigger warning. There's somewhat uh, outrageous. Uh, so uh, I'm just asking ask you to hold your outrage until uh, the end. <laughs> Uh, let me have it, or uh, hopefully you'll be able to correct me on the biology, which uh, I'm not sure I'm entirely right, but uh, it's not really about the details, it's really about a kind of overview that I'm uh, going to be uh, arguing for. Okay, I'd like to begin with a, a simple question, and, and thank you. Why is it that an organism sustains itself? The, uh, the question has the same form as other questions in biology. Why are cardinals red? Why do people throw dams? The latter questions are typically answered by referring to the reigning biological paradigm of evolution. So somewhere, um, at some time, having this color uh, or engaging in this activity allowed animals to survive pregnancy or survive in their environments. Less adaptive individuals were less likely to survive and the trait is established in the population. So can we say the same thing about an organism's ability to sustain itself? Why wouldn't we be able to do so? Could there be any uh, gene for self-sustainability? I don't know whether biologists ask this question, but philosophers seem to think that there could be a gene uh, that would have this trait uh, as well as any other trait. Certainly, um, Daniel Foster, Daniel Bennett, who's written and thought a lot about evolution, is convinced that every biological character came about through evolution. So we can set aside one version of this idea pretty quickly by thinking about how evolution is possible. The assumption is that uh, external circumstances change in some way that threatens a population. Some organisms in the population are better equipped to cope with this new environment, new circumstances, and continue to thrive, whereas others are less adaptive, uh, whereas those uh, less adaptive are more likely to die. So this is only uh, indirectly a story about evolution change. Uh, philosophers tend to think of evolution as a kind of progression. It's get, things are getting better and better, more specialized. More. And, and I think that that's, um, in, in a way, backwards. Um, the, uh, the organism, from evolution seen from the perspective of an individual or organism, is all about uh, stability. Uh, how can I remain the same if, if the organism could talk in these circumstances that are no longer fa so favorable for me. Uh, I don't want to change, I want to be who I am. It's only us, human beings, who think about you know, what can we do to improve our tennis game or whatever. But the, the organisms, uh, it's, it's just the opposite. They want to stay as they are because they're, in some sense, programmed to do so. So it seems to me, uh, if this is the case, there couldn't be, there couldn't be a gene for self-sustainability, because in order to have self, in order to have evolution in the first place, the organism has to have a tendency to sustain itself. I'll say that again here. It, in order for there to be evolution, the circumstances change, and the organism strives to remain as it is. Could there be a, a way of evolving to self-sustainability? No, because in order for there to be evolution, in the first place, there has to be self-sustainability. That's what it is that allows there to be evolution. So it seems to me that it's misguided to talk about this arising through evolution, self-sustainability. OK, if it didn't come through evolution, where could it have come from? So I'm going to make a couple of suggestions here. Uh, this argument that I've just given will not convince everybody. And one response, the first response might go like this. Maybe there's not a single gene for self-sustaining behavior, but surely there could have been stages of development from loose associations to a stricter interaction cause. A chemical equilibrium, for example, is established when the concentrations of chemicals are such that they, the chemical reaction tends to go in one direction, and it's balanced 
by this opposite chemical reaction going in the opposite direction. The, the, where the equilibrium stands depends on the concentrations of uh, the reagents. So maybe, um, maybe a, uh, the self-sustainability is something like that. Likewise, once a crystal structure emerges, it tends to grow and extend itself. The process is interesting, but not terribly mysterious. So why should an organism's growing and sustaining itself be fundamentally different than the sustainability of the kind of equilibrium or the crystal structure? Biological self-sustainability is a more complex version of chemical uh, stable states that tend to grow and preserve themselves. Just as we understand the forces that are responsible for bringing uh, a reaction to an equilibrium and growing crystal, we can understand the pathways that sustain an organism. So that's one suggestion. Okay. But there's an important distinction between chemical equilibrium and biological self-sustainability. A chemical equilibrium occurs when the chemicals are balancing each other. Biological self-sustainability requires a function on the part of the organism. It seems to me that every biological organism has two needs, uh, an energy source and a repair mechanism. The energy source of your bicycle is you. And the bicycle wears itself out. The gears and tires of the bicycle wear down in use. So too, the cells and organs are actively functioning, and they're wearing down. They therefore need an energy source to keep functioning, and they need some sort of mechanism to repair themselves. So, okay, this, that's why the living organism needs to take in food and to excrete waste. In contrast, the chemical system that's stable is relatively inert. We can think of the equilibrium as the reactions proceeding in the opposite direction. But the molecules don't wear out, so far as I know. I think it would be interesting to find out that they did wear out. But that's another story. The organism is functioning in a way that the chemical system is not. An organism is actively self-sustaining, whereas the chemical system can remain as it is. And this raises the question again. Why, what in the organism makes itself sustaining? And it highlights one point. The organism could not have evolved to be self-sustaining. It needs to be self-sustaining in order to be an organism in the first place. So maybe we're not really talking about the evolution of an organism. It couldn't be. Maybe we're talking about an evolution in chemicals that somehow give rise to the first primitive organism. Maybe uh, it's just a, a kind of uh, bootstrapping. Uh, there's one sort of conglomeration of chemicals and they somehow hold together and they tend to hold together and preserve themselves and they get, tend to get more complicated as things. And, and maybe eventually we get to the first primitive organism. That's the way that uh, Daniel Dennett actually understands uh, evolution. So the first point uh, to note is that this kind of chemical ev evolution is really different from biological evolution because it doesn't have the same self-sustainability that's, uh, that's uh, pushing the evolution. It's really a primitive form of association. And the second thing I want to mention is that there is a difference between structure and function. Um, I can throw a deck of cards up in the air and make, I mean, there's a finite chance that they would land in four separate suits from, in order, uh, ace to, uh, to king or whatever. I can calculate the, what the chances are. It's finite but small. But when I talk about the, those same cards somehow functioning together, um, the, the probabilities become much more difficult to, to understand. It's, it's much more difficult to have things function together, especially when we think about a biological system where part of the things that are functioning together are being produced by the organism itself. So it, um, I don't have a, I don't have a, I'm not interested in, in, uh, in, in affirming evolution or denying evolution or the other. It seems to me that it's, it's just, enormously difficult to understand how it could come about. Uh, there are people who proposed uh, uh, 
it, it, especially in the time that's available. There, it, it's so difficult that some people, like Derek Parfit, wants to say, there must have been multiple universes. Uh, and we just got, we got stuff the good one where things actually work out. There's other, <laughs> if it, almost infinite number of universes just, just didn't work out. That's how, how, the, how little the probability uh, uh, really would, would go as far as I can see. All right, uh, I'm going to leave that uh, somewhat in between. I'm going to switch to uh, my, uh, my next uh, point here. I'm going to shift gears and talk about a, the scientific paradigm, paradigm that begins in the 17th century. Um, the, the, the paradigm that this, the, the modern science begins in the 17th century, as does modern philosophy, and one of the decisive moves that begins both of them is a rejection of the Aristotelian paradigm that had been uh, the preeminent way of thinking about science before that. And what did that involve? It involved a rejection of uh, what are called final causes. So uh, walking for the sake of health is a, a paradigmatic idea of a final cause. And the people in the 17th century, notably Descartes and Spinoza and lots of other people said, these final causes make no sense as causes. And they had two arguments. Um, the first one is uh, that health doesn't actually exist. So you can't, it can't be the health that is actually causing the walking because it comes about at the end of the process. So it can't really exert any kind of causal agency. Um, OK, fair enough. The second one is we don't even need talk about walking the health is exerting causal, causal agency. Because if as long as I think that I can improve my health by walking, that desire and that thought are enough to motivate the walking. In other words, final causes are playing no role in science because final causes don't exist until after the action is over, and final causes are unnecessary to explain anything that occurs. That's a simple simple version of these arguments. They're actually pretty simple arguments. Um, in fact, these arguments were enormously successful, um, at least for physics and for chemistry. So, so the, um, because of these arguments, the only kind of causal agency is what Aristotle calls, what medieval interpreters of Aristotle called efficient causality. It's what we understand as cause when we hear the word cause. It's one body hitting another body and moving the other body. One charge uh, interacting with another charged particle and moving that other charged particle. That's what uh, causality is. And the physicists were able to, the early physicists were able to, to uh, uh, take this idea and develop uh, an enormously impressive and influential system. And likewise, uh, the chemists followed pretty soon afterwards in developing this idea of causal agency. The one area where the 17th century paradigm was not successful, at least not successful immediately, is in biology. And the reason is, uh, it seems to me, that the, in biology, the issue is, um, well, an organism is what it is because of its function. And it is, it's hard to identify the same kind of causal agency of one body interacting with another body interacting with another body. Now, um, to be sure, not impossible. And the first time this paradigm becomes important in biology, it seems to me, uh, is through the theory of evolution developed in the mid 19th century. That's a causal theory along the same lines. And um, there's a change in the environment that causes somehow a change in the organism, and that change is somehow uh, passed along. And we have a, a beginning of theory. The theory, as it initially appears with Darwin, is pretty weak. It's not until we get uh, the theory of evolution combined with genetics and the subsequent development of genetic biochemistry and genetics that it becomes a really uh, pretty sophisticated uh, 
endeavor, as you all know better than I do. Um, okay, so this um, this idea, this question I want to uh, um, explore here, the question I want to explore is whether or not this paradigm as applied to biology really makes sense. Um, and that's a hard question to ask and even to think about. So I want to say that it, it, there's a, there is a way in which it is limited and even um, even in, intrinsically contradictory. Uh, um, so why, why is that? First of all, let's go back to the Aristotelian paradigm that's displaced in the 17th century. What are final causes? Um, I've given you the arguments against them. Uh, it was as if somehow Descartes and Spinoza had a kind of collective amnesia about the Aristotelian idea of what a final cause is. The final cause is a, a form. And a form is a function. And the form of a biological entity is what the organism is doing. And what it's doing is it's engaging in various chemical, biochemical processes that are sustaining that organism itself. So on a simple level, um, the dog uh, exercises its sense of smell and senses to hunt its, hunt its food and or to you know, find its way to your to the doggy bowl, <coughs> and the um, the um, the food sustains the dog, so it can continue to do what it does. The activity of the animal is self-sustaining, and, and Aristotle has an interesting way of putting this. He says there's a, uh, it's a, a kind of metaphysical entity. It's called he calls it uh, an actuality. It's the way it's usually translated. And the actuality is an end of itself. The activity that any organism engages in is for the sake of the organisms engaging in that activity. So the first idea is that the final cause is not something that comes at an end. It just is, it accounts for, it's a way of understanding the activity, the functioning of the organism as it sustains itself. And the second uh, way in which final causes play a role in, in Aristotle's philosophy is as the end of development. And they don't play a role, a causal role in the, in the modern sense. They play an explanatory role. So it's, it, this is an example that Aristotle uses in his metaphysics. If uh, the, the physician notices that your limb is cold and you're having a problem with it, uh, the physician next reasons uh, what is it that can warm up this limb? And next reasons, it's rubbing that warms up the skin and the flesh underneath. And then the physician begins to rub. So notice this, we have an end, what precedes it, what precedes it. And it's likewise uh, almost the same with the process of development. There's an animal that comes to be through a process of development. In order for it to come to be, there had to be a preceding step, and there had to be a preceding step, and a preceding step, and so forth. So Aristotle says, if a house came to be by nature, right? it doesn't come, right? come by the house builder, but if it did come by nature, it would come to be in exactly the same way. Because it's that form, that end, the final cause, that determines the steps of the process of development. So this is another sense of causality. And it's a sense of causality that uh, is just absent from the 17th century paradigm perspective. Now, what's wrong with this 17th century perspective um, in terms of biological organisms? Descartes uh, famously said, animals are machines. Um, now, why is that? <laughs> it's such a terrible uh, way of thinking about it. Way. Uh, uh, man is also, we're, we also would be machines as well, except we have souls, at least that's what Descartes said. And that makes us different from animals. But we have the same kind of, because, the same kind of function. Because once you've eliminated the final cause, which is a self sustaining function, a functioning for the sake of functioning, as I just uh, tried to explain it, 
once you've eliminated that, the only causes that you have available are causes that one body striking another body, striking another body. Um, the kinds of causes that we find in mechanics and in electrodynamics, um, um, those causal sequences, causal chains. And if, if that's the case, then when we look at a human body, what we can see is one thing causing another function, causing another function. The human body is just a, a rather sophisticated machine. Okay, so maybe there's lots of things, you know, there are feedback mechanisms and other things, but really we're talking about a kind of machine. So um, one consequence of this 17th century scientific paradigm is that an organism becomes a machine. And the second consequence, which is um, also uh, improbable, is in order to set this machine in motion, you need some thing, some agent. So uh, if you, you know, your car is a machine, you turn on the key or press the button, whatever car you have, the car starts uh, to work. You're the agent that sets the car in motion. And one thing moves, another thing moves, another thing, and so forth, and so forth until the car is uh, actually functioning. Now, why is this, um, what's wrong with, with this, this idea as human human beings or animals or organisms as machines and organisms as one thing causing another. I think we've, uh, we've heard it from the beginning of, uh, of, this, of this morning. There's a, an interrelated network uh, of functioning parts rather than a single cause. And it's not the case uh, that there is one object that sets another object uh, in motion. But a, a network and a sequence of things that are interacting and going back and, and forth. Uh, it used to be thought, uh, it used to be said, that genes are somehow in control of the cell. And I, th I think um, it's pretty clear from what I've learned from you and from um, reading um, about gene regulatory networks that that's just not the case, that there's a whole complex mechanism of interaction with the parts interacting with each other. And this idea of the gene mechanism, rather than the gene as the agent that's, that's setting other things, things in motion, is uh, it undermines the 17th century paradigm for science in general. Now, okay. What's so surprising about that? Uh, well, uh, I think that that's the outrageous part that I warned you about. I think we, when, when philosophers talk about science, they're still thinking about it in the 17th century terms. And, and yet, well, <laughs> <laughs> philosophers, yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, yet, um, there are scientific theories that are are, are clearly not part of this uh, paradigm. The most notable is uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, when when uh, Heisenberg is talking about quantum mechanics, it, uh, he is he's explaining that you know you just can't think of this as a body moving from one place to another under the influence of some sort of uh, causal agency. It's a statistical theory. And the fact that somebody like Einstein would object to this and say, you know, we, we, we can't, you know, God doesn't throw dice, we can't understand a statistical theory. It, it's an indication of how powerful this 17th century paradigm is. That one object is responsible for the motion of another object or the change of another, and so forth, and we can have a, we can have a secret theater if it's hard to describe. In quantum mechanics, we don't know where the object's going to be uh, exactly, and yet we have a, we have a theory. So I want to suggest there is a th there's at least one good theory that doesn't conform to this area. There's another theory I suggest as well. There are other there are other ones uh, as well. But I suggest that um, that. Uh, Infor the information sciences 
are not causal in the 17th century way. Um, and this is, it, it is pertinent to uh, what I'm talking about because the philosopher Daniel Dennett, whom I mentioned earlier, thinks that uh, everything comes about through evolution and evolution um, it's sort of like a computer operating system. That uh, one, uh, one app, one or function can be controlled by another function. And, another. and, and, and Dennett is really interested, is most interested not so much in evolution, but so much, I think, as in showing that there's a naturalistic account of the way organisms come to be so that we don't have to rely on God. Uh, I'm, um, uh, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not trying to make a case the other way. I, what I'm going to do is just to understand what, what's at issue here. So uh, again, it says, just as the mind is like a computer operation, just as the computer operation is a natural uh, kind of process, so too, how am I doing for time? <laughs> okay. So, uh, so too, um, um, the, this, there could have been an evolution that would come about uh, in a natural way and produce something like mine. And what, what I want to suggest is that the whole idea of an information, it's, it's more like a feedback mechanism. It's more like a, a process. It's more like a gene regulatory network than it is like a a Newtonian science of one body striking another body striking another body. It seems to me this is another example where the 17th century paradigm just doesn't really work. And there, there are other ones, uh, there are other ones as well. Okay, so with that, I want to, I want to uh, go back to my original question, and now we can ask it in a, 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 a broader way. What is it in, that's in the organism that makes the organism self-sustainable? And now we can ask the question and say, uh, what is it, what kind of science, what's the paradigm of science that would allow us to answer this question? Because the 17th century paradigm, as, as I've tried to, uh, tried to argue, leaves us with one part moving another part. That's, not, that's just not the way organisms work. It leaves us with a machine. And I didn't say this, but ironically, the more that an organism is a machine, the more the organism is really specified in its activities, and the less plasticity it has. And this is the irony of evolution, it seems to me. It's a 17th century style causal theory that relies on the organisms being a kind of machine. But the more that it's, the organism is like a machine, the less plasticity it has, and the less capable it is of sustaining itself in different in, in changing circumstances. So it, it, in a way, it, it just undermines itself as a, a theory of biological entities. All right, so given that, now why does an organism sustain itself? And here, I want to uh, talk about, and this is another outrageous thing, I want to talk about an Aristotelian model. So, um, The, sci the scientific account that modern science displays was modeled in biology. Made modern science made enormous progress in physics and chemistry, but um, we need to ask whether the results of the recent work in biochemistry fit better with a different paradigm. Um, so I said earlier that the final cause of an organism is the functioning together of the parts to sustain the organism. And this functioning includes the organs, the cells, the cell organelles, and the proteins that constitute the organism. And moreover, this final cause is also essential, the essential nature of the organism. Whereas the modern paradigm sees these functions as characteristics that matter takes on, the Aristotelian perspective sees the functioning as essential and primary, and the material that undergoes the functioning as secondary. And here's the one quote that I, I have from, uh, uh, from Aristotle's Deanna. He's talking about mind 
here actually. And he wants to say that, uh, that mind uh, is not destroyed by the destruction of the body. But, but what's more interesting is what follows that. If, if mind could be destroyed, the most probable cause would be the feebleness of old age. But in fact, possibly the same thing occurs in the sense organs. Pro sorry, probably the same thing occurs as in the sense organs. For if an old man could acquire the right kind of eye, he would see as a young man though, sees. Hence, old age is due to an affection, not of the soul, but of that in which the soul resides, as in the case of the drunkenness and disease. Now, soul is, has long since uh, ceased to be a scientific uh, term, but it, 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 for Aristotle, the soul is just the difference between a living thing and a corpse, uh, or a, a dead thing, whatever that is. So the functioning thing, is this, the f form is another term for soul. So the claim is, what defines the animal is its function, its functioning. And if that's the case, then the material parts, they could be replaced. Um, now, this is inter it's interesting, not just because he's talking about organ transplants here. I mean, he's not really just a, a, a thought experiment. Uh, that's not really what, what makes it interesting uh, to me, uh, although it is interesting. But that what makes the thing be what it is, is the functioning of the parts and not the parts themselves. So uh, again, to go back to my, uh, my simple analogy, you, if your car is broken down, you can replace the car, uh, I don't know, they don't have car breakers, you can replace, replace the engine or, the, or uh, whatever, whatever it is that's, uh, that's broken. And the car isn't defined by the parts, it's defined by the functioning. It is what it is because it works in the way that it works. And it could do that just as well with other, other moving parts. And I want to suggest that in the Aristotelian paradigm, what defines the thing is that the organism is the functions of the organism. So the gene regulatory networks and all of the other pathways and networks that are in the cells and in the organism as a whole are what make that organism what it is. And in, in it happens that um, something breaks materially, the organism itself has often the ability to repair itself and substitute new matter. In one sense, it's not any different. It's just how everybody, we all understand that's how nature works. On, other, on the other hand, it's completely different because that, again, the 17th century scientific paradigm is science is all about matter. And matter takes on functions or doesn't take on functions. The paradigm that I'm suggesting, based on the Aristotelian paradigm, is that it's really about the function. And the matter is something that's secondary and can be easily replaced. And I think that that is what we see happening. Final thing I want to, uh, the question I want to raise is whether Eric Davidson did not make some such of, of an ontological inversion to think about the organism as a set of functions rather than a bit, some bits of matter. So thank you. I was very amused because you took a, an interesting pathway to get to this. But actually, uh, in about uh, 20 years ago, or 17 years ago, Eric and several computational biologists, colleagues actually put together a couple of papers in which they were emphasizing the way that the architecture of regulatory network circuits did a job independently of the identity of the molecules that were linked in those circuits. So it was very much like what you were talking about, although at a much I mean, in between atomism and the, the final cause level, but certainly the idea that the job 
was something that could be expressed by the architecture of the circuit, even if the elements of the circuit were different in different situations. So I think in that sense, it would have been very much what you were saying. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. I, I don't know. I see a little different. Uh, when you said, I, mean, I, I found it highly interesting. Thank you for the, for the lecture. Um, when you said the organism is a um, set of uh, functions and not a bits of uh, not consists of bits of matter. I think this reflects still the 17th century philosophy, because modern biology actually shows that you cannot separate them. The set I'll of say, functions choose, choose is one. related. The set of functions is related to particular molecules, and this is also what uh, separates uh, biology from from chemistry. I mean, of course, molecules are chemical. But uh, the, the way they act in an organism, namely in, in a specific way, in um, specific catalysis, but also uh, in speci specific gene network, I mean, this is not to be separated from function and from information. And um, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it belongs together. Oh, okay, so good. I, I, I was emphasizing the functional part. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, I don't, don't make it like that. But, yeah. but, oh, it's, okay. but this okay. functional part is, is based on a bit of matter. And Eric Davidson, to, in order to construct his G network, I don't know, for many decades, he, he, he worked on the functional parts. And, and, he, and then he, he put them together. And uh, so I, I think it is really fascinating. That, that, that's great. That, that, actually, it's a great comment because. I, I kind of simplify things and stress the function so I can contrast it with the material. But I, in fact, I uh, that, yeah. Aristotle also says the the organs are ordered, structured, so that they have the function that they do. Isn't there a problem with the way that we understand the word cause? Because I think, you know, of course Aristotle's final cause, as you were pointing out, we don't consider a cause. But um, I'm just wondering about lost in translation issues. Well, right, so, so cause is not a great, it's not a great translation. The word is in Greek is idea, and sometimes people say it's just for responsibility. But on, on the other hand, there, there is something to it, because, because one of the things, the, the organism functions in such a way that it sustains itself. Yeah. So DNA. It, what's that? That's why DNA exists. Well, okay. the DNA is actually a tremendous part of the answer to what you were posted all through the talk. And I kept sort of saying DNA, DNA, DNA. <laughs> the DNA by itself isn't an organism. Ah, but it's, it, is, no, no. It, is, it is a piece, of, it's a unique kind of molecule that can create um, self-sustainability. That, that's, a, that's a mechanism for self-sustainability, which actually fits a well, lot of but, right, but, yeah. uh, no, but it can't create anything. No, it can't. It can't, but it's a But it requires a cell, at least. It's a component yeah. that allows you to have that. There are another two questions, and then there is a very, 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 very short coffee break. <laughs> and the, and then James. I just wanted to, to give you a further piece of uh, ammunition for your theory position, which is uh, the incredible phenomenon of arrangement plasticity. So we talked about one of the things that distinguishes the organism from the machine is the organism's ability to repair itself. And it does it almost all the time. Cells die. New cell comes and takes the same place and does the same thing. And that is incredible. But there are phenomena where a stroke or a you know, good blow to the head with a frying pan damages some part of the brain. And some other part that was never doing the function of part A you know, takes over that part. You know, which yeah. to me is just static. It is amazing. And it, it, is, it does highlight that, that it's really about the function and not about the uh, particular, particular uh, matter. James? Yeah, thanks. That was really helpful because I, so you're sort of arguing for a sort of process whitehead type perspective on, on this problem, which um, I think many of us thinking about GRNs would, would synthesize with. The difficulty I always have is, is sort of understanding how information transmission happens in, if we think of it from that perspective. I just wonder if you could sort of elaborate on that. So I think it, I mean, Uta's comment actually about, and Ellen's on sort of the role of substance DNA in this is sort of helpful there, but 
how do you reconcile this sort of information idea of biology with the process perspective? I, I think that, that you know, the, this is, the DNA by itself is, doesn't do anything until it starts functioning. And if, in order for it to function, it needs a bunch of other things around it. It needs to interact with, I don't know, I, I don't know the details in ways that all of you know better than I do. But if you just talk about this as a, a single molecule, yeah, it's got, it's the basis of, of lots of things that happen, except nothing happens really without those other things. And there's some sort of interaction, some sort of signaling uh, process that occurs between the DNA and the other things, and the other things that <coughs> back to the DNA. And you, 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 get, a, you get a process. And it's, it, it's what, when I was in um, you know, college and high school, DNA was just, it was just it. That was the, what was good control was the cell. And I think that now, um, thanks to your work, um, and, uh, Eric Davidson's and lots of other uh, people, we understand better that uh, it's not just something, but these activities that are involved in different. So the, the information, that's encoded in the DNA isn't valuable until it can not just be encoded, but actually be expressed. And gene expression is, is, involves a bunch of other things happening. And that, the, the, that process is the kind of functioning that I, I am thinking is an Aristotelian notion of, how, of what defines the organism as the organism. I hope that answers, begins to answer some of your questions. Thanks, and if it doesn't, then... <laughs>